the Tuesday, February 8th, I'm sorry, February 9th, uh, 2022. And of course, this is a hybrid um, meeting. Uh, some members are here, some are not, but those that are not are connected with, uh, with their computers. So once again, uh, we got a little bit of a late start yesterday and uh, we ended up uh, not able to ask the questions of the commissioners. So we're gonna start out with them coming forward. Uh, if they would, I think it's Katrina, Kessler, whoever I guess you want up here. Who would like to start? Oh, yeah. I got a little taller chair there. Yeah, right. Uh, good morning, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. For the record, I'm MPCA Commissioner Katrina Kessler, and with, with me this morning are Assistant Commissioner for Land and Policy Kirk Kadelka and Assistant Commissioner for Air and Climate Craig McDonald. And we also have members of our fiscal staff here if there are questions that the three of us can't answer. Thank you and welcome. Um, um, Assistant Commissioner Craig McDonald, do you, do you have anything to add? I, I don't think you had testified yesterday, had you? Is there some things you'd like to talk about uh, before we open it up for questions? Mr. Chair, I am here to answer questions and support the commissioner in answering those questions today. Okay. Um, once again, just for kind of a real quick overview, uh, the, uh, um, this is the course of finance committee. Can you, let's go over again one more time, just the, uh, the, the as they call it, the 3,000 foot level as far as dollars that are being asked and for the FTEs. And, and uh, maybe we could just do a little overview of that and then we'll open it up for questions. So the amount of money being asked for is how much, Commissioner? Um, Mr. Chair and members, yes. Um, does everyone have a copy of this? Yes, I believe okay. you do, yep. So um, I will refer to this certainly for the FTE. This is a summary of what we had provided yesterday as a higher overview. And um, as noted in the questions from previous testimony yesterday, we understand there's especially an interest in the FTE. And so mm -hmm. this breaks down all of our supplemental budget items with the one-time FTE. So these are temporary unclassified positions associated with the one-time investment. Okay, so th those are temporary positions then, the 10? Yes, okay. yes, Mr. Chair. Yeah. And as well as the permanent positions, um, that's the second column. Um, it's called permanent. And I will note that the when I was discussing the adaptation action grants and water storage yesterday, that one in particular, we understand that those dollars we want to have available over five years to leverage federal infrastructure investment dollars over the five years. And so those positions are five years, but because the de definition of temporary unclassified is three years, they count as permanent employees. Okay. Um, as far as the total, I believe it's around 90, Okay, 87.42 million. Thank you to assist. And that, and that includes bonding requests as well. Mr. Chair, the proposals in front of us today are not bonding not proposals. Bond. No. Okay. Can you give us a little bit of an idea of what, what the bonding requests are, if there are any? Yes, Mr. Chair, um, I will. I will provide a overview and others can chime in here. So we have asked for 21.1 million in bonding to implement construction adaptation projects. So this is one-time grants to communities across the state who have planned, prioritized and designed projects to enhance their stormwater system to be ready for more intense rain events that we seem to be having more often. And this is a complement to the monies that we received from the legislature last session to do the planning grants. And we received um, many, many times the amount of requests for the planning monies than were available in our first round, which closed in December. And we're going through the process of evaluating that. So we know there is a need out there to do the planning and design. And we also have heard from communities that they need money to do the actual infrastructure projects to implement them. So that 21.1 million in bonding is to do that second piece of that, which is the actual capital investment in construction. In addition to that, there's $1 million in the bonding request to build out a continuous nitrate 
monitoring network in our large rivers that would include the Minnesota, the Mississippi, the Red, and the St. Louis River. It's one-time money to install continuous nitrate sensors that help us then pinpoint where we need to do more and track progress over time with regards to pollutant loads. And that's directly tied to drinking water since nitrate is a pollutant that um, is expensive to remove and also a problem and a health risk for drinking water. And then the bulk of the rest of the bonding requests are in the solid waste bucket. And I can turn it over to Assistant Commissioner Kadelka and he can describe those if you'd like that. Sure. Uh, first of all, the, the, the sensors you're talking about, can you give the, the uh, committee a little idea as to where that might be, where those sensors would be? Yeah, Mr. What? Chair and, and members, for the continuous nitrate sensors, we, we think we can get 40 sensors for about $1 million, and they would go at um, tributary entry points into those large river systems again. So the St. Louis, the Mississippi, the Minnesota, as well as the Red River where we have most of the discharge from either point sources or non-point sources in the state. And that helps us then understand where we need to reduce because it's a threat to drinking water. Okay. So we don't have a map of all of them, but we can provide more information if you wanna know um, po approximate potential locations. I will say that the, the, the points at which we would place those would be done be informed by ongoing watershed conversations with local partners. I'm sure you'll be giving that to the bonding committee, but I, that would be a that would be a good thing for I think our committee to, to see. And you're working with the red board up there on the Red River, then is that correct? Yeah, Mr. Chair and members, we would work with the red board and others who represent those watersheds uh, when we were building out the design. Okay. All right, uh, Mr. Kadelka. <laughs> Mr. Chair and committee members, thank you. My name for the record is Kirk Kadelka. I'm Assistant Commissioner with the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency. As the Commissioner mentioned, a large portion of the MPCA's bonding requests are for capital assistance program grants. These are solid waste grants that go to local units of government to build things such as material recovery facilities to help recycling or compost facilities or household hazardous waste facilities. And just over 34 million is spent in this way 10 million for an organics capacity grant that will be made available to local units of government. And then specific projects in Pope Douglas, Dakota Scott counties, Olmstead, Polk County, Chisago County, and Cass County all have proposals before um, in the governor's bonding bill that they had uh, sent to us and proposed. In addition, one other land item is the addressing legacy contaminants. As the committee may be familiar, we have frequently come before the legislature for bonding dollars to help with various contaminated sites that the state must oversee. And one of the, the issues as we looked at WDE and Andover, a closed landfill, is we found a neighborhood that had been impacted adversely by 1,4-dioxane and PFAS, <laughs> where about 50 homes have been impacted where they are not able to use their private wells. We're providing them bottled water, so they have safe, bottled, they have safe water today. But the governor's bill includes funding to hook up a portion of that neighborhood to the municipal system. So long-term, they have a safe drinking water. Those are the land items in the bonding bill. Okay. Mr. Chair. Commissioner. Um, there is one additional item that I would ask uh, Assistant Commissioner McDonald to speak to. Mr. Chair and members, for the record, my name is Craig McDonald, uh, Assistant Commissioner with the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency. And the additional bonding request that Commissioner Kessler is referring to is $13.8 million um, to help build out Minnesota's electric vehicle charging network. And critically of note, this $13.8 million would meet the requirements for a federal match that was passed as part of the Infrastructure and Investment and Jobs Act, which will trigger up to $68 million um, to the Minnesota Department of Transportation for electric vehicles and their charging network. So with this $13.8 million, the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency will build off of the work of the VW settlement and continue to build out Minnesota's electric vehicle charging network, ensuring that the traveling public can get where they go. These uh, grants will be delivered to entities who are interested in building an electric vehicle charging system, so primarily a DC or direct current fast charger, which will provide charging um, of up to 80 to 90 miles in about a half an hour, and it'll be built along existing EV uh, corridors. Thank you, uh, 
the question is, is that 13.8 part of the 21? Or is that additional to the 21 million? Mr. Chair, um, so the the twenty-one million dollars is for stormwater construction. That's okay. Grants. That's all and for so, that. And you're working uh, with PFA on that. Um, yes, we yeah. are working with PFA on that. Okay. All right. So, um, Mr. Mc Commissioner uh, McDonald, the uh, with regards to the electric uh, suit, so, so these are dollars that are going to be taken from the Volkswagen settlement. You said they'll be used um, to augment the Volkswagen settlement. Under the VW settlement, we can use only up to 15% of that settlement for electric vehicle charging. And this 13.8 is a general fund cash appropriation in the bonding bill, which will um, be distributed by PCA and by that team who's already been working on the VW charging network. And again, that will help leverage the federal funds at 68 million that was um, appropriated. So do we know how much is left in the Volkswagen fund at all? Uh, Mr. Chair and members, we are currently in the second phase of the Volkswagen settlement where we're distributing 50% of that fund, which is 23.5 million. And that builds off phase one where we distributed a quarter of the fund. The fund was $47 million, but with interest, we have about 50 million. So I would have to follow up exactly where we're at, but you can figure we've spent about a third of that fund of that 47 million. The staff have record of that, uh, Mr. Mueller? Are you there? Um, Mr. Chairman, um, I don't have anything new um, to add to that uh, other than what the PCA has testified. So I'll, I'll agree with their numbers for now. Okay, is that something that you want them to send to you or, or that you have access to, I assume? Um, Mr. Chairman, that probably would be helpful if the if the agency would send to me and to the committee some updated information on that. All right, I'm seeing some nods, so thanks. Questions, members? Seeing none. I guess uh, I guess we're ready to move on. So no questions. Uh, if there are any questions of anybody, of course we'll certainly have them get a hold of. Uh, you commissioner or your assistant commissioner. So thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. Mr. Chair, that you're on a different, oh, can I'm I sorry. ask a couple of questions of the piece before they go? I oh, thought okay. you were on a different right. part there. Sorry, Mr. Go Chair, ahead. my bad. Um, I do have a couple of different sections I'd like to ask questions about. Sure, so I'll have a few follow-ups. So I'll just bear with me for a minute or two. Here, Mr. Chair. Uh, commissioner, thanks for being here. First of all, my question is on the operating increase that you guys are looking for, for 5.5 million. Um, I know typically the operating increases are normally part of our biennial budget that we do in odd years. Um, and it looks like a, it, it, Typically, the PCA requests a small general, or you guys requested a small general fund operating increase, but none from the environmental fund. And I'm just kind of wondering what changed since last year's budget where an operating increase was not requested. Commissioner. Mr. Chair and Senator Eichern, thanks for that question. Um, you, you are correct that last year we did ask for an operating increase as part of the biennial budget related to the water programs where we saw a particular hole where we were gonna lose up to 14 staff if we weren't able to continue to fund those positions. And that exercise combined with the announcement around the surplus in the general fund led us to realize that we need similar increases within the uh, land programs to make sure that we can maintain the services that we have. So it was the analysis around the positions, the cost of living increases, as well as the opportunity that presented itself with the general fund that led to the proposal. Follow up. Okay, um, that makes sense. Um, I'd like to do ask a question on another section. That's your solar panel recycling. It looks like 100,000 a year from the environmental fund. Um, how much is the fee gonna be? Uh, is the solar panel industry on board with it? And do other states do something similar to this? Commissioner. Uh, Mr. Chair and Senator Eichhorn, I'll ask Commissioner or Assistant Commissioner Kadelka to, to give the details on that. But I will just say that this is something that we've heard from local partners and county planners that is a challenge right now, and they want to get ahead of 
the need to dispose of solar panels. And so we're trying to be responsive to what we have heard. And with as regards to the details, I'll let uh, Assistant Commissioner Kadelka weigh in. Commissioner Kadelka. Yeah, Chair and committee members, thank you for the question. I um, have a couple of them. If I miss one, please let me know and I will add on to it. The potential fee to panels to fund the program. I'm sorry, you're, I think you're going to have, I think Senate, Senate uh, media is going to come running in here pretty soon and adjust that for you. Is that better? <laughs> sorry about that. So the program sets up the manufacturers through a product structure project stewardship organization would set up a process to collect discarded solar panels and then properly reuse, recycle, or dispose of them. So those, the program funding would be set up by that process. Uh, until that's done, the amount that's needed to have revenues to fund that program would not be set until later once the plan is built by the manufacturers. So at this point, we don't have a dollar amount on what that fee would be done, would be the product stewardship organization would set that based on the needs uh, as they've identified in their plan. You had mentioned the 100,000 in the governor's budget. Our product stewardship organizations, such as paint uh, product stewardship, operates on a system where there's oversight by the agencies, uh, by the MPCA. And what we do is we end up billing our direct costs to the product stewardship organization, and then they pay that back. So the what you see in the governor's budget is the reckon. Uh, recognition that there will be cost by the agency. The agency will bill that to the product stewardship organization, they will pay it. So the governor's budget has that uh, funding mechanism to allow for the collection of that and to cover our staff costs in that. So it's not actual um, pull from the environmental fund other than what revenues we would receive through the billing process. Follow up, there may be a couple. I'm curious, um, I know you haven't set what the fee would be yet, but who's gonna pay the fee? Um, and do you have any idea what it might be? I know you haven't said it yet, but just kind of a range would be helpful. Um, I'm glad we're talking about recycling solar panels. I think that's important as you've got quite a few that are gonna be coming offline. I'm concerned about what the cost is gonna be because we know the cost is not gonna be absorbed by the manufacturers. It's certainly gonna be absorbed by individuals. And if we wanna have more green economy, um, raising the price, for people to purchase solar panels, which exactly what this would do, I think is probably the wrong step. And the other question on if part of them have to be disposed, how and where are they disposed of? I mean, we've seen pictures of windmill panels or windmill, like the blades getting landfilled in places because you can't do anything with them. You know, I would hate to see that kind of thing continue. If we want to be good stewards of our environment, I think we need to find a better way to dispose of these. And instead of pushing it off on another state, maybe a Minnesota solution is warranted. So if you could talk about, again, who pays the fee, the range, and then how, how they're actually disposed of. Assistant Commissioner. Sure, uh, thank you, Chair and, and, and committee members. It's great questions. The fee for product, stu product stewardship organizations would be upfront. So the manufacturers would put that on their, on their product and then be collected and sent to the product stewardship, or, product stewardship organization. It's very similar to how paint operates today. There's a small fee when you buy a paint that is collected and then goes to the product stewardship organization to take care of the properly managed materials. It's a very upfront and so everyone is aware of it. Currently, those costs are hidden. When someone buys those panels, it's never talked about how the, the person who purchased those panels will be responsible for the end of life. Those costs come up too, where then when a panel is damaged, for instance, during a storm or that, it is the owner of those solar panels that's paying for the cost, which they were not really planning for. So this helps create a very transparent and a, a system for folks understanding those end of life costs exist. In terms of the actual amount, we, we don't have that number. Washington State also has a product stewardship, product stewardship organization. They're in the early stages of it. So we don't have that, um, that dollar amount. The question you had then also is what happens to these? The goal is for some of them to be reused. There are a lot of recyclable items in the solar panels. A lot of it's glass and metals that can be used and will be needed for additional solar panels to be made in the future. So our idea is to create a closed loop system where we have solar panels coming out of the system, being going back into the manufacturing process and being made into new solar panels. 
if they need to be disposed of, for some reason they can't be recycled, they would have to be tested to determine if they are hazardous or if not, and then they would be properly disposed of in a landfill or other means that could handle the type of materials the solar panel is, is created out of. It will depend on the different types of solar panels. Oh, I'm gonna, I'm not, I don't have a follow-up question. I do have one other question on another section, but I'm just gonna make another comment on the, the solar panel piece. Um, first of all, I, I, I'm a little disappointed because again, the, the consumer is gonna end up paying for this and I think it's gonna make it harder. It's gonna be another barrier for the average individual to be able to try to go green. I am glad we're recycling. You did mention uh, some of the critical minerals, the heavy minerals. Some of those obviously we would like to see extracted from the state of Minnesota. Unfortunately, there's not enough solar panels, fax machines and cell phones to you know, recycle our way to a green economy. And in order to get to where we wanna be, I think we need to further the discussion on what extracting some of those minerals from Northeastern Minnesota looks like, because we do have um, a lot of those minerals we are gonna need to continue this. So I hope we can continue that discussion at a later point. And then I wanna to transition to um, the action grants and water storage. It's a $54 million appropriation. Um, that's a lot of money, I'm assuming that's meant for one time. I'm concerned that, you know, it's a big pot of money for us to give you guys to appropriate. Is this gonna be for planning? Is it gonna be for infrastructure? Um, and then again, my concern would be when this pot of money goes away, this is an ongoing thing. And if we're gonna do something, it, it truly needs to be a one-time thing. So I'd like a commitment from you guys that it is truly one-time, but I'd also like to understand um, you know, what exactly it's gonna be used for. Because if it's, if it's infrastructure, um, what is it going to be if it's planning? That seems like a lot of money just to plan. Who'd like to take that, Commissioner? Mr. Chair and Senator Eichern, thank you very much for the question. Um, it is a lot of money, and we recognize uh, that this is a one-time pot of money, and that is how we are planning to use it. Uh, it, again, is over the period of five years, anticipating that this will help unlock additional federal dollars that are coming to the state via the state revolving fund through the public facilities authority. So as you may know, in order to for a project to be funded by the state revolving fund, you need to have done the planning in order to get on the list. And some of this money certainly would be eligible for planning, but we also know that there is a huge need related to capital investment I talked about the stormwater system, but it's beyond stormwater. There's inflow and infiltration that comes into the wastewater system, as well as other public spaces and infrastructure within communities that are impacted by mega rain events. We know that by talking to just Duluth, Mankato, Rochester, and the metro counties that many cities have capital um, plans that's that are tens of millions of dollars just for one community to start to get at the adaptation and resilience that is needed. So I 100% agree that this is a lot of money, that uh, we would take this very seriously and we do intend to have it be a one-time investment and almost exclusively pass through to help communities prepare. Just quick, so this is more for planning than anything else? Commissioner. Uh, it's. I would say that planning is a component, but the most expensive part of this is implementation. I do have a question, um, uh, Commissioner, maybe whoever would like to answer this is with regards to the agency operating increase of, and you've got maintaining 42.12 uh, employees. Do the, ex explain that a little, little clearer. Are those, are those gonna be one time or is that somebody, is this gonna just create the workload of, of already somebody somebody that's employed? Mr. Chair, Commissioner. Um, I'm gonna ask Assistant Commissioner Kadelka to provide the details. Commissioner. Chair, Chair and committee Chair. members, thanks for the question. These are existing staff and the resources to continue to have them move forward. So it's an example of a hired staff person that's doing permitting in our solid waste program or helping get grants out the doors, it's making sure that we're able to maintain those staff. And so the 42 folks represent folks at the agency that we will continue to employ with these dollars. If not, the, the risk is that we would not be able to employ them be, due to increasing costs. Okay, so, so what you're saying is if you don't get this, then these people are gonna be laid off, or some of them. Mr. Chair and committee members, correct. And services will 
that they are providing to businesses, right. individuals, and local governments would then suffer. Was that brought up during the budget cycle last year? I don't remember. Mr. Chair and committee members, as uh, mentioned by the commissioner, uh, we looked at this and used the opportunity for the supplemental budget to look at this. Uh, we did water last year. Uh, one of the issues was that there just was not enough money, for instance, in the environmental fund to be able to do all the programs in the agency. So this is us coming forward to handle the land support and operational programs uh, that we weren't able to do last budget cycle. Um, the other question I have, and I'm going to go back to uh, Assistant Commissioner McNall. Um, you said the 13.8 million um, that you're asking to appropriate from the, with regards to the Volkswagen money, is going to create a 65 million dollar match from the federal government. Mr. Chair, uh, thank you for the question. So the bonding funds is a general fund cash request um, that is separate from the VW settlement. Um, however, MPCA is requesting that to augment the existing VW plot. So that is a new request, and we would use the existing staff and resources that we have through VW to issue those grants. And that 13.8 will be enough to meet the requirement um, for a new pot of money that the federal government has appropriated through the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act. Uh, when that was passed last fall, it created a new program under the Federal Highway um, Association to provide states with additional funding for EV charging networks. Each state has to provide a 20% non-federal match to release those funds. So for Minnesota, based on the formula, it's $68 million is what we can expect if we provide $13 million in funding. So that bonding request provides that 13 million, which will release the 68 million from the feds, allowing Minnesota to invest $80 million into its EV charging network. And that would be in addition to the VW settlement. Okay. Members, any other questions? Seeing none, um, thank you very much. Thank you, and Mr. If we have Chair. any other questions, we'll certainly feel we'll be getting a hold of you. Uh, actually, uh, uh, I would like to have some time, and we'll talk about it with staff. Maybe you can prepare a little bit to come back and talk a little bit more about recycling, recycling the. Uh, 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 substance where we talked about solar as well as uh, the blades. I mean, that's getting to be a big topic now. And, and I'd like to hear uh, just exactly how that's going to happen. So, all right. Happy to do that, Mr. Very Chair. Good. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you. Next up, we have Executive Director, Board of Soil and Water, uh, Director Jasky, and Assistant Director Angie Becker Kadelka. Welcome to the committee. Two of you, we met yesterday, but go ahead with your presentation uh, uh, and identify yourself for the record. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. John Jasky, Executive Director with the Board of Water and Soil Resources, and with me is Angie Becker Kadelka, Assistant Director. <clears throat> uh, and we're here today to give an overview of our uh, supplemental budget recommendations. Can you hear me okay uh, up there? Thank you. Um, and so I thought I'd give a little bit of an overview. Um, we've got you know, a little bit of our mission statement in the beginning of our presentation, which is very brief, which is, you know, our projects and programs and all of our work really works through local governments, that, that local network of counties and so on, water conservation districts, watershed districts, cities, even some townships get involved. And of course, we also do some of the work with, uh, you know, non-government organizations as well because of that local approach to getting the job done. We've got uh, four items that we're going to mention and I will take the first two and Angie will take the, the second two. Uh, the first one is a water storage uh, program which was passed into statute, the framework for it last year. And this program focuses on holding water on the land in places where we're seeing additional both rate and volume of runoff, you know, the water moving in greater amounts and with greater speed, you know, causing, you know, downstream problems with infrastructure and water quality and and the things that come with, you know, water moving either in greater amounts or greater speed in various places. And so the, the program is focused on two parts of the state that are most, uh, I guess, in, in, in a situation where this is an issue, and that is the Minnesota River and the Lower Mississippi River. Uh, those areas have 
um, a lot of altered hydrology as well as topography that you know causes this situation. And so we believe that this proposal will get us you know going a quite a bit further than the initial allocation that we had last year of two million dollars. Uh, as we have talked with you and others before, you know we hope to take these dollars and turn it into additional on the ground work with federal sources being helpful in that regard. Um, I can give you some acronyms, you know, the, the federal government has plenty of those, but uh, there are programs in the USDA, uh, PL 566, RCPP, WRE, I can give you more details on any of those you'd like, but the way this would work is we would use these dollars to, depending on what the federal sources were, to either use easements or contracts or even some more variety of things such as flowage easements and what might be needed to you know, put water in places of either permanently or temporarily to hold back the water from releasing downstream. So you can see in the, if you have a copy of the presentation that we provided, uh, the Minnesota River, for example, you can see the over time trend there with water uh, amounts uh, becoming greater over the last number of decades. Excuse, excuse me, director, you're gonna, you're gonna have to try and pull that thing a little bit closer as well, I think. And maybe it's my hearing that's going here, but I, but I, uh, I think it's quite, it's not. <laughs> well, I'll belly up as close as I can. Okay, you know, you're, good. you're good. Oh, okay. Thank you. Well, I'll do my best here to get. Uh, that's fine. Yeah. Okay. Um, if you want to take ask. questions at the end, Mr. Chairman, if you'd like to do questions in, in between, it's up to you. If uh, you know, you're going to do the two, first two presentations and we'll open it up for questions. Okay. All right. Thank you. Uh, the next item is done uh, in a combination package with the Department of Agriculture, the uh, Healthy Soil Program. We, we had a, some conversations last year around this, and of course, we had, we had brought forward a proposal uh, and there, there was a bunch of others that came along as well, you know, some of which had more policy probably than, than practices on the ground. And th this is all about the practices on the ground. This is about putting in place in a voluntary way, a, a larger number of you know, cover cropping systems, uh, conventional, I'm sorry, not conventional, but conservation tillage uh, systems, perennial vegetation, whatever it takes to put something green on the land in, in as year round as we can get, right? And that's the, that's what soil health is really all about. It provides you know, this benefit of moving carbon into the soil where it can actually do some good to grow the crops that you know, farmers are gonna need to grow and whether it's the traditional crops of um, you know, corn or soybeans or whether it's other things as hay and, and alfalfa. Uh, these soil health practices, and sometimes they even use you know, animal agriculture as a component of it as well because they can graze these areas where that's uh, viable. But this is the one way we can do something that we use the land in the same footprint, you know, in a more significant way year round. And the, the, the way this works is we work with the individual landowners, again, through the local conservation organizations, uh, including the private sector too, because a lot of the crop consultants and co-ops, you know, are, who are also helping farmers with their, uh, productivity, and, and they have a lot of the data that's important to this as well, um, they can bring to these landowners techniques, um, experience, uh, recommendations of various sorts that allow them to understand what it would take and then work through that transition period that it takes to be successful. And generally that's a, you know, three or four or five years sometimes, depending on, you know, the kind of weather you get and so forth. Um, we, as again mentioned earlier, we expect a federal contribution to this through again some other programs that you know environmental quality incentive program or EQIP or the CSP program, the conservation stewardship program, that would also be able to add dollars into this on the ground work. The component that's uh, the complementary piece is the Department of Agriculture has a proposal uh, that's combined in this in this sense with us where they would provide equipment grants because some of these practices take specialized equipment to plant these, these cover crops in particular, or in, case, in some cases tillage as well. And they would provide those dollars for equipment purchases that could be shared among landowners, you know, via either soil and water conservation districts or some of the co-ops and others that are providing those services. So uh, Mr. Chair, I can give you more details if you'd like, otherwise I will take questions on these two and then we can cover the two other items that uh, Ms. becker Kadelka will cover. <clears throat> Thank you, Senator Root. Thank you, Mr. Chair and uh, Mr. Jeske. So 
Um, I, I guess I'd really like to see what that program is. Um, last year, there were many programs that were put forward that had arbitrary and artificial goals mm -hmm. and um, percentages that farmers had to meet in order to um, qualify or, or um, uh, they were being pushed to practices uh, that had these arbitrary goals and percentages. And so um, is your program um, uh, voluntary uh, so that they that they really, I mean, I believe in soil health, but I think making goals and, and um, percentages for farmers to meet um, that really have, are not based in science, like we had proposals last year. Um, so is there an actual program for the soil health or? Yeah, Director. Uh, Mr. Chairman, Senator Rood, a uh, couple of things. One, we did, we had a demonstration program very much like this, where it was practice oriented, right? Just, you know, voluntary, of course, through, uh, we had five soil and water districts take that on. We, we had many more interested, but we only had a limited amount of money. And so that's been going now for two years and proven very successful. And, you know, you create a little demand, and of course, the demand grows, you know, and there's you know some frustration on their part because they'd like to fulfill it, but they don't have the resources to do it. But back to the question about goals, um, you know, goals can be useful, but they have to be based in something, as you indicated, that's scientific and this and practical as well. Because in Minnesota, we have, as I mentioned earlier, you know, different soil types, different topography, and very different cropping systems. Right? If you think about how and and weather systems too. Right? And so we think that goals could be useful, but it's got to be based on a process that's going to have some tie back to a sound foundation. And in the in the language that's been is being drafted still, I, mean, I know we haven't had a chance to share that with you yet, but uh, there's a process for working on goals, but not establishing goals. And using the University of Minnesota and the agencies and other experts to help do that, I think would be the way we suggest uh, working on it. Follow up. Um, and Mr. Chair, and um... Mr. Jasky, I would love to, when you have that language, um, to have you visit with me in my office. I think in order for me to support this based on what happened last year with soil health, I would, I would love to see a program going forward, but I would like a little more comfort zone as to what the um, goals and uh, are, so that I, I know that they're not a mandatory goal, that they're actually a goal that, that you know, um, people will want to achieve. So. If we could maybe, um, when you get that language, have another um, visit in my office, I would love to welcome you there. Mr. Good. Chairman, Senator, we'd be happy to do that and present it to the committee if the committee is interested as well. We're waiting for the reviser to get things you know, put forward. So uh, we'll get it to you as soon as we have it. Thank you. Thank you. Senator Eichhorn. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I've got two questions. We'll do the easy one first. I see you've got 125,000 for tribal uh, support liaison. Um, how are those costs covered now? And my assumption is that equals one FTE. If it's different than that, if you would let me know, that's the first question. Um, Mr. Chair and Senator, I'm going to Angie, Angie Baker Cadelka answer that question. <clears throat> Assistant Commissioner, please identify yourself. Good morning, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. Angie Becker Cadelka, Assistant Director of the Board of Water and Soil and Resources. Uh, Mr. Chair, members, thanks for the good question. The tribal liaison was a new statute that was enacted just last year by the legislature, and I believe it's statute uh, 1065 that requires government to government relations uh, with the 11 federally recognized tribes before it was an executive order. When it was moved into codified statute, the Board of Water and Soil Resources was added to that list. And so this would be a new position that we have. This is a new requirement of the agency, which is a good thing, right? It, it mandates that we must uh, consult with tribes on the budget, fiscal and policy work of the agency. And it requires that we have a designated liaison. So currently we do not have that. And so this would be uh, building that into the agency and it would be for one FTE to do the coordination, the liaison with all the tribes and interacting with all of our staff. Follow up. Uh, not on that one. Thank you for the answer to that. The other one I have a question on is uh, your water storage request. Um, the action grants and water storage, you guys are asking for 15 million one time, similar to what I asked of pollution control. I'm worried that that turns into an ongoing thing. And how does this differ from what they're doing? Because if you add years to theirs, we got 69 million in 
action grants and water storage. And that's the first one was a lot of money, 15 million is a lot of money too. And it also looks like kind of an expansion of the 2 million that was authorized last session. So if you could touch on that a little more, um, and I'd also like to know kind of what's, what are you doing different from the PCA or is this just the same program through a different agency? Director. Yeah, Mr. Chairman, Senator, a um, couple of things on that. Uh, the last question maybe first is that yeah, it is an extension of the 2 million that was appropriated in the past biennium, so this would be supplemental to that. Um, this work is is directed under the statute that I mentioned. Uh, I think it's 103F.05, which was passed last year. Um, the, and our our work is focused much more on the the headwaters, the you know the more rural parts of the state. I would say probably because the the cities, the infrastructure pieces are the part that the MPCA is focused on, right? Because they have these these dollars that as Commissioner Kessler mentioned that can come through the revolving loan program through PFA, uh, those, those, those pieces of infrastructure that are built to do uh, water management, whatever form it is, whether it's wastewater or stormwater, et cetera, are generally uh, directed through municipal work. Um, our work is in this case focused and that statute provides that is focused on the headwaters areas, holding the water higher in the watershed before it becomes a problem downstream in terms of either rate or volume if that helps you. Yeah, Mr. Probably. Chair, that helps a little bit. And uh, 15 million sounds like a bargain compared to 54. So maybe you guys, I don't know if there's some way you guys can work together to save some money if, if any of this goes forward, but it's a lot of money for one area, certainly important work, but um, I just wonder if there's a way to get more tie together to try to save the state some money. So that's the, just a comment there, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Mr. Chair, I can just make one more comment on that. Uh, you know, I know you asked about planning and one of the things I would tell you is that we do have a good bit of that accomplished already in Minnesota. We have the, the one watershed, one plan concept, which has been voluntary, but been very uh, well received. And, and so counties and so water conservation districts, water districts, cities have worked together on that. And that helps uh, use the science we have to pinpoint the places where we can provide project dollars and practice dollars that'll do the most public good, right? And we can use that information for this purpose. Um, you know, I expect that because of the infrastructure components that the MPCA's piece has, they would probably need to do some more of that, although you know, municipal organizations are doing that as well in the Metro and beyond. So I'll let them speak to that if you have more questions on that piece. Thank you. Um, maybe director, uh, a little better, uh, overview of what actually happens in rural Minnesota. Can you give us an idea of the water storage acres that are that are uh, already uh, set aside for the Red River? Um, Mr. Chair, maybe we can do a little more research and get you some information. I will say that we, with the $2 million, $1 million each year, we've got this pilot now that we've just put the RFP out for, you know, a million dollars. Sounds like a lot in some ways, and it is, but you know, for that very large area, the Minnesota River and the lower Mississippi, we're going to seek proposals here in the next, you know, month or two that will give us some sense of how this could work. And there's yeah. lots of opportunities. Uh, there's a lot of different ways of doing it, too. You know, we can hold water, you know, in a static fashion by building a little, you know, little or big structure to hold it back. We can use dynamic storage by re-meandering streams to slow the water down, right? More distance, more friction, you know. So there's a lot of different ways to do this. And we have engineers and biologists who will be evaluating those opportunities based on some of those plans that are already there and, and giving us suggestions on where these things are ready to go and hopefully you know ways that we can bring in federal money to do it as well. Yeah, I've been around long enough to uh, remember uh, the streams that they did in the Red River Valley to make them straight actually to drain quicker and we go back and we actually <laughs> put the meandering back in again so uh, sometimes we mess with mother nature and, and uh, we got to go back and fix it. Uh, so there is some different ways of slowing down that water for potential floods. Um, I guess I don't have any other questions. So, director, uh, assistant director, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair. The one remaining item in our supplemental budget is the COVID unreimbursed cost. And Mr. Chair, we'd like to thank you uh, for the letter that you sent to the governor in October of this past year, uh, along with your counterpart in the house asking that Bowser be reimbursed for these COVID related costs. This is a one-time reimbursement. In addition to those standard equipment and supplies that all agencies had uh, during COVID, one of the things that Bowser recognized was an entire field season that was lost. And so this reimbursement, the majority of this is 
to address the loss of the field season with surveying, design, engineering, all the contractor work of, of hiring contractors to move the earth uh, and, and do that conservation construction and conservation oversight. And so this would allow us for a temporary position to catch up and then also to work externally with contractors uh, to do a catch up on some of those uh, um, important components that were lost during the COVID uh, pandemic. And with that, Mr. Chair, I think that concludes our supplemental budget items. Okay, members, any questions? Again, this is supplemental. This is uh, uh, something more uh, over and above what we uh, budgeted for last year. So everybody needs to, you know, needs to know uh, leaving here that uh, uh, these are these are asks, these are wish lists, and we all understand that. And with the uh, the amount of money that we have in our surplus, we understand people coming forward. And uh, but where it ends up from there will remains to be seen. Um, I don't think I have anything further. Um, no, I'm good. So great. thank you very much. If you have any questions, we'll get a hold of you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank members. you, Mr. Chair. And I think last on the agenda is. Uh, The Metropolitan Council supplemental budget request. And there we have Judy Sventic. Water resources, are you are you available? There you are. I am here. Good morning, Mr. Chair. All you got to do is look, I guess. There you are. <laughs> Good morning. Um, Good morning. Welcome record, to the committee. Thank you. Mr. Chair and members of the committee, for the record, I am Judy Sventic. I'm the manager of the water resources section for environmental services at the Metropolitan Council. And I'm here today to share you information on our supplemental budget request. I'm going to share my PowerPoint and I'm, uh, hopefully you will be able to see it. And I will ask if you can see it in a second. Can you see my PowerPoint okay? Yes, we can. And can you hear me okay? Yep. Perfect. Sounds good. So our proposed project is mapping infrastructure, climate risk, and resiliency opportunities. Governor Walls is recommending that $5 million from the Supplemental General Fund appropriation be used to create this web-based planning tool for use by metro area communities and watersheds to help protect local infrastructure from adverse effects of extreme weather events. This tool will bring together data um, to enable local planners, watershed staff, city and county staff, and others to assess risks related to floods, droughts, blizzards and other extreme weather events on our built environment and the infrastructure that it supports. Extreme weather is impacting the country and it is not exempt from that. Unprecedented extreme weather events have happened across the region and nation over the past decade. For example, in New York City, one such event in a hurricane caused flooding where 11 people drowned in places where flooding was not expected. In Duluth in 2012, you're aware that there was the storm event where we saw 10 inches of rain that caused over $100 million in damages. Um, several Lake Superior an zoo animals drowned, city roads were torn up, and an eight-year-old boy was swept into a culvert. Metro examples include from 2014 to 2019, the Twin Cities metropolitan area received the equivalent of seven years of rain in five years, which stressed our built environment. We are seeing more rain, more intense rainfall, and more frequent events. Basements were flooded due to excessive rainfall and inadequate stormwater infrastructure to transport that runoff from these precipitation events. In 2014, there was a flooding event in Minnehaha Creek. There's also flooding near Lake Nokomis. Our current maps don't, tell, don't always tell us where this flooding will occur. Then in 2021, we experienced the first major drought in years. The state activated the Minnesota statewide drought plan, which placed restrictions on water use out state and in the metro area. These are just a few recent examples to show why we are looking to work with our partners to create this tool. We have heard from our partners that they need a tool to help us help them to identify impacts from changing weather patterns on this infrastructure so we can protect our infrastructure. We need to locate new infrastructure where it's not at risk from extreme weather. We need to strengthen existing infrastructure so that we can make it more resilient in the face of new risks. Infrastructure that I'm talking about today is includes, but is not limited to like broadband, internet placement, 
roadway is built so they don't have to be elevated later, locations of critical services, fire stations, schools, critical stormwater infrastructure to prevent flooding. This web-based tool will bring together many data sources to build a decision tool to help with looking at planning scenarios in the future in order to protect our infrastructure. Potential data sources and information needed to be brought, need to be brought together, updated, and in some cases developed for this model too model to work. Mm -hmm. So some of these data sources include historic precipitation statistics, projected climate modeling, groundwater modeling, local storm sewer mapping, um, additional and updated high resolution land use data, infrastructure location information, water routing, hydrology flow paths, and risk calculations. Our plans are to peri periodically update this tool with new information and better information as this information becomes available. So at this point, we're just asking for the funds to get the first version of this tool developed. In the end, this project will create a planning tool for our partners, cities, counties, watersheds, state agencies, to help them identify where they may, may have critical impacts to their infrastructure based on current as well as future weather patterns and conditions. This will be a tool available for use by local governments to help prioritize and target community public works projects to help them prioritize the right level investment on infrastructure in the right places. And that's the key to looking at the right places to be building in this infrastructure in the future. It can also be used by state agencies to help prioritize state bonding funds related to infrastructure and also to help them prioritize and award future climate and resiliency grants. This tool can be used by private property owners to make informed decisions on their property, as well as help communities and others identify areas of risk that might affect those that are economically or socially disadvantaged. I want to reiterate, the use of this tool is for our partners at all levels of government, and it will be developed with their input. Um, the use will not be mandated by the Metro and Council. Um, this tool is really going to be a web-based free tool for all in the region to use, and we're working closely with them to help develop it. So with that, if there's any questions. Members, any questions? Mr. Chair, thank you for coming on to present this for us. Um, is this, again, for planning or infrastructure, is this money going to develop something web-based or some kind of app, or is it just for planning to do that? Uh, and is there another potential opportunity for somewhere else, whether it be bonding or legacy funds, to do this? Mr. Chair, Senator Eichhorn, this is for the actual tool. So it, um, there'll be several phases of the work over, you know, it's, we're anticipating it'll take through 2026 to spend the money. We'll need to hire um, consultants to help update data layers. So it's actually developing data layers, um, updating current layers or data sources, I should say, um, and then designing this web-based tool for people to use. So it, it will be at the end of this period, there will be a tool out there people can go into and um, look at their, their area, map out their area, and make decisions about infrastructure for their specific area. Just to follow up, Mr. Oh. Chair. Um, in my opinion, this is, it's a lot of money to develop a, a web-based platform. Um, my understanding is some, some of this probably already exists. I don't know if there's a company out there, and I know there's companies out there that do this kind of work. Um, instead of reinventing the wheel, you know, maybe you could do it for a million instead of five million. Um, just seems like a lot. Some of this data being put together, I believe, well, at least in some of my counties up north, some of this data you're looking to present already exists through county GIS systems. So it seems like we're being rather duplicate, du duplicative. Um, so I just wonder if there's a better way to do this. Maybe you've already interfaced with some of your counties, um, but I just see some opportunities to maybe do it different and save some money. So I'll just end with that comment, Mr. Chair. Sure. Senator Rood. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'm, I'm just wondering um, what the use of this um, uh, information being at, as a small town mayor, if I had, um, if I had to make decisions um, on infrastructure and building projects, I would put out bids to the best company that I could um, to come back to me and they would have, they would have this information. I, I, I don't think I would put it up to my council members to be um, experts on all this information and go to a web-based site to look at it. I would 
hire a professional private company that would do that for me. So I, I'm not sure what what this, you know, who would use this information and really, um, I, I just, I'm, I'm failing to see the need for this web-based site. Sventic? Yes, Mr. Chair, um, Senator Root. So there's, and this kind of responds a little bit to Senator Eichhorn. So there's a lot of data layers out there, I agree, but um, they're in data sources, but there's things that we've been trying to get done in the metropolitan area for years. There's a need for, um, stormwater mapping of all the infrastructure of the stormwater for the region. Um, it's been done in, there's a little few efforts that have gone on. We've not really had the money to um, do a pilot, but so it would help update that. It, it would help update um, the precipitation models that are out there that we recently went into an effort with the surrounding five states to update that work as well um, through, through, through NOAA. But to your, your question, Senator Rood, this tool would be used by the city planners, the city engineers, and yes, they have some of this information, but it will be giving them updated information to you to use, and then it will be giving them this web-based tool that they can then kind of look into their areas with this tool, um, map out a certain specific area. Um, it can it can highlight flood-prone areas. It can, and it will also be updating the resources that they have for the new weather conditions that we are having. So a lot of the other models and the other tools that people have right now are um, looking at pre precipitation where it's not as frequent, that less intense and things like that. So it would be just updating it with the current conditions of today. Follow up. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and, and thank you, Ms. Fendek for your presentation, but I, I still fail to see the, the need for this um, web-based um, Thing. So, thank you. Thank you, Senator Root, and I, I, uh, I have to chime in a little bit here too. And I, I do want to know what, you know. And I look at the presentation here, and I appreciate you being here and asking. Uh, however, I do have some issues. Uh, state agency prioritize state bonding funds and award climate and resilient grants, resiliency grants. <clears throat> Tell me how that's going to work, as well as uh, prioritizing property owner make informed decisions. Uh, how, how is a property owner in in the metropolitan area going to know that these dollars are even available? And and tell me the, how this would work. Sure, um, Mr. Chair. Uh, so it's very it's very complicated, as you said. I mean, it's the, especially for the property owner who you would have to probably be a property owner who's considering some kind of change to their property, working with the community, you know, where can I, if, if maybe they want to subdivide and build, or they want to add to their proper, their impervious service on there. So then they would work with their community who would then help them use this. They would probably use the tool for the property owner to help them make decisions about areas that would be okay for subdivision. And um, we're talking lar larger property parcels mostly. Um, and I think, as to the question of how it would help state agencies, it could help, um, you know, it could be a tool that could be used by um, PFA as they're making decisions about where they prioritize the dollars um, that they have available for infrastructure improvements and um, and where the most critical areas are to get that infrastructure in the ground as we have limited dollars in that area. I'm trying to think of the other part of your question. Yeah, so, and, and, and the last one I have is uh, to identify areas of risk that might affect those that are economically or socially okay. disadvantaged. Um, there's been an awful lot of, of uh, uh, discussion about this particular group of people, which we seem to have singled out here, uh, that are socially disadvantaged or economically disadvantaged. I'm not understanding um, the workings of that at all. How would you do that? I'm, I'm sure you already know where this is. What what would you do to help those 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 identification those those people that are identified here in your presentation? Sure, Mr. Chair. So one example is um, you know we have talked to actually the city of Minneapolis, the city of St. Paul, Hennepin and Ramsey County about the need for this tool, and they're working with us on this. So they are very interested in this tool. So they feel like. Um, they would be able to use it to just, you know, get a better handle on the conditions for their community, um, of which, you know, there's, we'll be able to look at areas of um, disadvantaged areas or poverty areas of concern and see if there's um, ways that we can develop that or put in projects or practices or 
best management practices for stormwater that will help alleviate some of these flooding issues that they typically tend to have more of than in some other areas. Okay. Members, any other questions? Thank you very much. Thank you. For the presentation. Members, I think that concludes our uh, business for the day. Uh, any other questions or concerns at all by the committee members? I don't see any on the uh, screen. With that, we stand adjourned.